and people will start trickling in. Here they come. There's a mad rush into the entrance. <laughs> Hello, so we'll everyone. Wait. Welcome to our second Choosing Our Climate Legacy Priorities for a More Equitable and Resilient Ohio webinar. This series aims to discuss the future of climate resiliency in Central Ohio. Today's guest, Vivek Shandas, will be speaking on situating climate adaptation measures within historic disinvestments in urban neighborhoods. My name is Jerrica Logan, and I am the outreach coordinator here at the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, otherwise known as CURA. I will be your host for this event. If you require co closed captioning, you will find a box at the bottom of the screen called CC. Click on this box and select show sub subtitles. This will allow you to see the subtitles during the presentation. Feel free to submit questions at any time using the webinar Q&A box. We will ask as many of your questions as we can in the last portion of the presentation. And if we do not get to your question, we apologize. If you have any questions following the event, feel free to email me at logan.433 at osu.edu. This event is approved for once AICP CM Equity, Sustainability and Resiliency Credit. To claim your CM credits, log into your My APA account on the APA website and enter, your, in, enter this event into your online CM event log. There will also be a brief survey at the end of this webinar. If you have the time, please provide your feedback. I am now gonna pass it over to our director, Harvey Miller. Thank you, Jerrica, and hello, everyone. Greetings from sunny central Ohio. Welcome to today's seminar. This is part of Cura's regular series on issues and challenges facing the cities and regions in Ohio and beyond. Our next webinar in the Choosing Our Climate Legacy series will feature Robin Lachenko from Rutgers University on March 25th. And also on April 29th, we'll have a panel discussion featuring OSU thought leaders and community leaders on the topic of building a more resilient climate future. Please visit cura.osu.edu slash events to learn about this and other future events. Sign up for our monthly letter newsletter at cura.osu.edu. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our guest this, this uh, afternoon, uh, Vivek Shandis. He is a professor of climate transformation and director of the Sustainable Urban Places Research Lab at Portland State University. And we also learned earlier today, he's actually becoming a geographer at Portland State University. So welcome to the wonderful field of geography, Vivek. Uh, work, but he does work as an interdisciplinary scholar he examines the assumptions that guide decisions about the built environment and uses spatial analytic tools and policy evaluations as a means for identifying socially inequitable outcomes in the era of climate destabilization. He has published over 100 scientific papers, four books, and serves as a consultant and technical advisor to the public sector, the private sector, and nonprofit organizations. He's been featured in the New York Times, National Geographic, Scientific American, Times of India, Le Monde, Volkskrant, CNN, and other media outlets. So he's very, pardon me, very well known, very visible in this area. Uh, during his very scant spare time, I'm sure, Professor Shanta serves as chair of the City of Portland's Urban Forestry Commission and enjoys the mountains and waters of the Pacific Northwest as anyone would. So on that note, I will turn over to you, Professor Shanta. Look forward to hearing your remarks. Many thanks, uh, Jerrica and Harvey. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, chat with you about things I've been working on. Um, I want this to be kind of a conversation. I'll, I'll um, be checking the chat as, as I'm presenting here. I have, I have about um, 15 slides I wanna go through, uh, just kind of more visual than anything else to kind of put material um, directly in front of you. And before I do that, though, I'm, I just want to acknowledge the fact that I am standing on unceded territory um, of indigenous com communities that have lived in this area um, that I am in, in Pacific Northwest, specifically Portland, Oregon, for uh, time immemorial. These are um, tribes uh, known as the uh, Multnomah, the Clackamas, the Clackamas, the Tumwater, the Lala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, 
and, and many other indigenous nations that have lived and continue to live along the river known as Wim, Wimal Nicha or the Columbia. Um, it's really quite a honor to be able to uh, steward this land and care for this space and uh, have this conversation with you about how best to kind of navigate some of these massive climate disruptions that we're um, increasingly becoming aware of. Um, today, um, I've, I've titled my talk um, as, as I have in part because um, it's gonna require, it's gonna be hot, it's getting hotter. So the sweat idea is really front and center. And uh, the idea of equity is really about um, uh, distributional impacts um, of what we are uh, confronting in terms of a changing climate. And um, the, I, the, the situating climate adaptation measures, we're in a time where we're trying to adapt as quickly as we can. There are many organizations of all different kinds trying to adapt. Um, and I'd love to have a conversation with you. I'm going to um, leave some time for um, a, a deeper discussion, hopefully towards the end. I have about uh, 30 minutes or so that I'll be chatting and um, uh, describing things I've been working in, and then really want to open it up to conversations with you to understand what's happening in Columbus, what's happening in Ohio, what's happening in the broader um, Midwest, as well as the country and world areas that you might be working in. I'm specifically interested in urban neighborhoods and um, strategies, policies that have been used um, to uh, uh, change the physical form of neighborhoods. And the physical form translates to, in my mind, the values that we imbue upon uh, specific places. Um, and, and so a little bit about me, I grew up, um, before I get started, I, I find it important to situate um, the speaker. Uh, who, where am I coming from? It, it will suggest to you some of the limitations the blind spots that I may have in, in the conversation we have today. Um, always open to learning about things that I have missed. I think we often learn more from, um, from constructive and critical feedback than we do with uh, laudable responses. And so I uh, really want to set the stage with my identity as a socio-spatial urban ecologist. That means I think about space. I think about how it's managed. I think about the social values that have gone into the creation of that space with a real focus on the ecosystems, um, these human dominated ecosystems in which we live. And so I think about social change, I think about power dynamics, I think about uh, adaptive management. Um, I spend a fair bit of time trying to understand community resilience. And I grew up in this picture here um, in, in South India um, and where the streets were covered with all kinds of structures that I have yet to see in, in the United States. These were streets that I walked in that had cows and chickens and, and monkeys on some of these trees. And it was um, a, a real um, intense urban environment where humans, uh, where humans as part of nature really intersected and watching the rapid landscape transformation was something that I grew up with. And at about 10 years old, my parents immigrated to uh, the town of Santa Rosa, California, which was in the news in 2017 um, because of the Tubbs fire that uh, was a very urban fire. And, and it basically cleared my old uh, home where I grew up, as well as a lot of my friends' homes, uh, places where I had gone uh, for high school events. And it was a uh, it was a reckoning that climate change and many of these events that we experience are getting closer and closer to our backyards um, and a real need. And part of my interest is really understanding how, um, how we can share in, under, in, in, um, in discussions about how, what we can do to better prepare our landscapes for these um, rampant changes that are underway. And so that, that's a little bit about me, um, my background. I'm really generally interested in generating dialogues about um, what it means to be stewarding and caring for these landscapes we live in and how local decisions can either exacerbate the implications of a changing climate or potentially mitigate and prepare uh, communities that often are hit first and worst by these events. Um, so with that little short background, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this physicality of spaces, these neighborhoods that we live in. Um, these are images taken um, um, from uh, um, uh, Ohio. Um, and one of the things that I have noticed is that 
um, the ways in which our, our landscapes are um, designed and developed is often based in a set of code. And that code is a set of values that we are imbuing into our planning systems and into the spaces that we go about um, designing and developing. And that code often allows for investments to happen in some areas and not as much investment to happen in other areas. That's the phenomenon of disinvestment that I'm gonna be talking about a little bit more here. Um, and so a neighborhood like this um, can be put right next to a neighborhood just less than a mile away that can look something like this. And so these are two neighborhoods, very different in their physical forms, very different in their landscapes, really um, lends itself to questions about what does it mean to be living in spaces and whether the roads are paved, whether we have walkable sidewalks, whether we have green space, whether what our um, yards, what our um, general infrastructure looks like, what that infrastructure will do with a lot more snow or a lot more rain or a lot more heat are questions that I'm, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about these days. Um, so in terms of the, this kind of neighborhood situation, we've been hearing a lot about the changing climate and um, just um, earlier this week, we had discussions about the, um, the dropping of IPCC, the International pa um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, dropped a, a, another report um, on Monday that essentially shows that um, cities are really implicated in this report as being places of massive generation of greenhouse gases and also potential places of adaptation. And what was interesting about this report and something I've been working on for a long time and really trying to get a bit more visible is the notion of disproportionate impacts from climate. And so you might well know that uh, these reports are pointing to the fact that communities that have less coping capacity might be hit hardest from the changing climate and that we are having global discussions on it. I wanna argue that these are very local realities that um, we are facing and that decisions that we make are really going to be far more um, important in the coming uh, decade than they have been for a very long time. And that's really about how we trans transform our urban areas to be better uh, equipped, better adapted, and the communities better engaged to be able to respond to this changing climate. That's really the punchline of a lot of what I'm going to be um, presenting some examples around today. Um, so if you're with me so far and you're kind of following this conversation about uh, climate change, about disproportionate impacts, about cities, then we're really um, going to be making some progress today. Um, the the um, way in which our federal government, as well as a lot of planning and, and kind of decision-making frameworks are set up is really about exploring the hazard if, if we're talking about climate resilience. Um, it's about exploring the hazard, assessing vulnerabilities, investigating options, prioritizing and planning, and then taking action. It's a very systematic, um, tractable approach. And it's these, through these five steps, uh, the, the theory is we can build resilience. And I wholeheartedly agree with this in terms of the ability to understand hazards, the um, assessing vulnerability, and down the line. However, the claim I want to make to you today is that the, taking our classic planning approach uh, systematically like this can often fly in the face of well-intended efforts. And those well-intended efforts can often preclude the ability to truly prepare um, and, and um, engage a community effectively and thereby building resilience within that community. And there's a few reasons why. Um, one of the challenges that we've been observing over time is just that the same systems that created a lot of the inequities that we're hearing about in the IPCC report from this week, as well as um, many other reports of disproportionate impacts from climate change have not changed since the inception of old policies that have been around for a long time. I'll be spending a little time on this policy of redlining that, was, um, that existed from the 1930s through the 1960s. Um, so the same um, kind of race-based and um, uh, uh, discriminatory policies of the past are in play today is a provocation I want to pose to you. Um, I also want to suggest that simply investing into marginalized neighborhoods, that means um, putting in new buildings, uh, tree planting efforts, um, 
bike lanes, et cetera, these sustainability measures that we hear about um, can often amplify inequities. They can create a lot, they can amplify distrust, they can create uh, precarity in terms of economic stability, and they can really affect our ability to even keep things that we wanted to put in place like trees or green spaces um, to, uh, uh, to thrive. And that's a second provocation I wanna challenge with some of these classic uh, concepts of planning. And the third, I simply wanna provoke you by um, suggesting that what we need are far more um, kind of community-based efforts that engage communities and allow us to really build from the ground up in terms of what are the needs a community may have, how would climate potentially exacerbate some of those uh, uh, or, or really um, affect some of those needs? And then how do we go about creating a, a power sharing process that allows communities to have some autonomy as well as ownership around projects and processes that play out at the local level? Uh, seems fine in some ways, but yet the actual activation of some of these particular concepts can be very, uh, challenging. And I want to present an example as to why that might be the case. Um, a few years ago, um, we started looking at this particular set of data. Oops, and I and I'd mentioned this, uh, this topic of redlining. For those of you who don't know uh, what redlining is, in summary, it was a policy, federally codified policy in the 1930s that essentially um, uh, graded neighborhoods within cities across the US in terms of risk. And the risk was around defaulting of loans. Uh, in the 1930s, we were coming right out of the Great uh, Depression. There was a real interest in the federal government to um, kickstart a lot of the housing and ho um, home starts are one of the primary indicators of the gross domestic product. And so really getting the economy going again, um, local planning agencies, consulting companies, geographers, um, where urban geographers were um, kind of brought in to be able to delineate specific neighborhoods in terms of four grades, A, B, C, and D. And you can see the language here in terms of how these areas were being graded and A being the best, meaning where we want to invest a great deal, B being still desirable, we wanna provide services, mortgage-backed securities in these areas that are A and B. Those C and D neighborhoods, we, we really want to um, we really recognize as risk, the, the um, home, homeowners loan corporation, as well as the federal housing administration, two of the administrating federal agencies um, would, would identify these as definitely declining and hazardous places to invest. And so this disinvestment that started in the 1930s um, really created these four different neighborhoods across cities. And we've been spending a lot of time trying to understand what was, what did that particular policy have an effect today? And we were, really, um, we were really inspired by some work coming out of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago that illustrated very empirically and very unequivocally that the areas that were C and D in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s were still in deep economic um, precarity, meaning uh, there was intergenerational poverty, there were uh, communities and, and households that could not really um, get out of particular vicious cycles of, of, of poverty. And that really led in many ways to the wealth gap. It led to a variety of other social policies such as um, uh, that, that have really affected these communities that were in red and yellow through this day. I have a map of Ohio, uh, I'm sorry, of Columbus uh, here. And um, you can, if you're familiar with the, um, with the city, you can see that you know Central City was really a lot of the redlined areas, and then the suburbs are going outward from there. In the 1940s, were places that were green lined and blue lined um, in terms of investment, and so we see lots of cities in the Midwest and the East Coast having the similar pattern of inner city redlining, and that's where the term comes from: is drawing these red lines around these neighborhoods, and that really lend itself to. Um, a, a pattern of disinvestment in these neighborhoods um, over decades. Redlining was officially stopped after the Fair Housing Act in 1968, though racial covenants and lots of exclusionary zoning policies continued um, prior to redlining and even continued through this day. So we wanted to take this one policy and say, so can something like this that divided our cities up into these four grades have an impact on our ability to manage and cope with a changing climate? 
And that was really the question we asked. And what we were looking at is the physical landscape of the redlined areas versus the greenlined areas and the, um, the, the temperature, which we can uh, characterize and measure in each of these particular red line versus blue lined areas or green lined areas. And so when we went about looking at how much tree canopy, for example, which could help in shade, it could help in air pollution, it can really help in stormwater collection, a lot of these ecosystem services that green spaces provide, which I'll come back to a little bit later, we wanted to see whether there was an effect between these redlining policies of the past and current day experiences of heat and, and, um, lands and green space. And what did we find? We looked across 108 cities across the country and we found whether in the Midwest, Northeast, West or South, that the areas that were redlined, meaning the D grade, um, neighborhoods consistently had less tree canopy cover uh, across the board. And that was easy to measure using satellite imagery and using um, local reconnaissance. And we can also start to look at this and notice that um, the quality of landscape is very different. In the A graded areas, keep in mind the A areas are quote the best and highly invested areas. There was more tree canopy across these uh, 108 cities that we looked at on average than the degraded areas, which had orders of magnitude more pavement, concrete, impervious surface generally than tree canopy. That difference in landscape is a measurable reality that I've been, uh, our group has been looking at for quite some time. And this was the uh, arguably the first paper to actually present this case a couple of years ago now that it was a very systematic pattern that we were seeing in terms of where disinvestment led to greater um, uh, shade, greater uh, cooling and um, the and that the uh, di and that the disinvestment led to uh, a lot more amplification of temperatures. Um, the average temperature difference between A grade and B grade across the country was, about five degrees Fahrenheit, which doesn't seem like much, but remember that's an average across, five, across 108 cities. And there were some cities where that temperature difference was as high as 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so that, that helped us kind of get to an understanding, questioning like what went on, what was actually happening in these places to create these differences in tree canopy and temperature. And what we were finding was that these D graded areas as well as C graded areas had greater amounts of asphalt pavement. When 1950s highway projects, Eisenhower was rolling out a lot of massive infrastructure projects. Many of those highways went right into the areas that had been disinvested. Think, uh, think about land hungry development like large scale housing projects, industrial facilities, highways. Um, uh, those would all require low land rent, right? So uh, per square foot, if there's a lower cost, we can put bigger infrastructure projects through there because it would be less per square foot. And by design, that disinvestment through redlining led, as we argue, to these kind of almost a gravity model where we were pulling all the high scale, lesser desirable land uses to these specific disinvested areas that were um, that were graded C and D historically. So a lot of neighborhoods got highways kind of motored through them. Big box stores got placed not coincidentally in those locations and industrial facilities, et cetera. And so there's been a lot more research since ours first came out that, has, that have corroborated these findings. And it's been very compelling to see not only heat, but also air quality, as well as uh, uh, pluvial flooding, meaning urban flooding, um, having a higher likelihood in these C and D neighborhoods than the A and B neighborhoods. So what climate change is in a way bringing is hotter summers, right? Longer uh, heat waves, more intense heat waves. And that lends itself to potentially some communities experiencing far greater impacts as a result of um, the, the changing climate. Um, we, just on a side note, I will, I will note in, 2000, in June of 2021, I was living in, uh, still living in Portland, uh, Oregon, and um, we had a heat dome that not only broke uh, records, historic records, it broke climate models that had been developed 
over the last 30 years. And the heat dome has been um, attributed directly to a changing climate that we had. And I went out, I went out with my son just because I wanted to get him off the video game for a little bit um, around neighborhoods in the, um, in the city. And I found that these red line neighborhoods um, in one neighborhood, it was 124 degrees Fahrenheit um, air temperature. And in another neighborhood, it was 99 degrees um, Fahrenheit, a 25 degree difference between D graded neighborhoods and A graded neighborhoods in 2021. And what was fascinating is I had a PhD student uh, get access to some um, thermostat data from inside homes across the city. And we compared a, uh, a set of homes in the degraded neighborhood to the A graded neighborhoods and found that the degraded neighborhoods average temperatures were around 120 degrees, whereas the A graded neighborhoods, the average temperature was around 70 degrees. So air conditioning, heat pumps and all that were more active in the cooler neighborhoods than they were in the hotter neighborhoods, making that temperature differential of what people experience upwards of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is Needless to say, a matter of life and death, in part because heat waves kill more people than any other natural hazard. So it's, it's really something that's on us right now. It's something I experienced in, in the city I live in. Columbus, I know, is going to be experiencing a great deal more heat waves, more intense heat waves. And the idea of preparedness and adaptation is really at the core of a lot of this work that we're starting to do. Um, you might think these are issues of the past, uh, that this nothing is happening and that these race-based policies don't affect us today. Though in, in uh, looking at the 2020 census that just came out, um, comparing it to uh, 1980 and looking at the population changed in A, B, C, and D areas over the last 40 years, we were finding that, that um, places that were C and D graded back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s or the places that also saw the most rapid rise in population, meaning that these large scale development projects like uh, multifamily residential housing were going into these C and D grade neighborhoods um, in Oakland, um, in the, uh, many West Coast cities, in Los Angeles, in Berkeley, in Sacramento, as well as in the town I live in, Portland. And it, these are percentages on the Y axis, by the way, it's a typo that I, uh, pardon the typo, and essentially uh, 0.10 is 10%, 0.15 is 15%, 20%, et cetera. And so what we're seeing is, you know, C and D neighborhoods essentially getting a lot more of this cement, concrete, uh, asphalt paving that happened throughout uh, the history of redlining. And we're seeing that playing out today. So it's in a sense, a new, uh, a new era of redlining that we're seeing, although not quite codified in that federal or local way, but playing out in the same physical forms in the places that uh, we live. This also creates what I like to, what I refer to as a green squeeze. So when we pave out, when we put in these large scale projects uh, like multifamily residential housing as we have, it pushes the available space for being able to get green trees in the ground, green infrastructure in place. And it really challenges our ability to cool those neighborhoods, thereby amplifying temperatures in these neighborhoods even more during heat waves that come through. So what? So what are we doing about this? Um, a study that came out a few years ago looked at 10 different forms of adaptation planning. So we know that this is a reality. We know that some communities are going to face this much harder than others. So what can we do about it? And this is kind of the more uh, pra practical kind of interpretation of what we're doing. Um, as I said before, um, we really want to think about uh, situating these adaptation measures. And so whether it's technology, whether it's um, financing, whether it's um, you know, physical infrastructure, uh, um, encouraging specific practices or behaviors, um, management planning, all these, these 10 different types of strategies that have been used to uh, address climate adaptation have been well documented and they, and they keep coming out. They really, I find, fall into one of these 10 bins, which uh, Beyond Genie and, uh, and, and others had, had identified uh, several years ago. I want to focus on just one to bring this kind of large field into a little bit more of a, uh, a tractable, tangible uh, reality of what we might consider. And I want to look just at this green infrastructure. We've heard about, uh, you know, billion tree campaigns, even trillion tree campaigns that have been set up. 
uh, whether it be uh, the 90,000 trees that mayor of LA is going for or the million trees in New York. I'm sure there are several such policies playing out in, in Columbus and, and different parts of Ohio and the Midwest as well. But trees are really cool right now. People seem to be thinking of them as a uh, stopgap measure for the amplifying temperatures. And so um, as, as chair of the Urban Forestry Commission, I have one foot in the policy realm and the practice realm and one in the research realm. So I really kind of uh, uh, um, straddle those two. And I, I want to kind of bring a very uh, practical perspective into this green infrastructure planning uh, question around adaptation. The news is replete with uh, inequitable trees, as I showed you from our study. It's very, the distribution of trees are very uh, inequitable in, in cities where some places have a lot, some places have a little, and that's no coincidence. That's what our study is essentially showing, that that distribution is not by happenstance, it's very systematic. Um, and we've seen this in uh, different ways and, and claims of being able to plant healthy air in specific parts of cities. What I wanna caution folks around is just being able to say, oh, these areas are hotter. Let's just throw a bunch of trees into that space. And that's where I've seen a lot of uh, friction and a lot of challenge when we think about practical um, things, we really think about almost like a knee jerk response, like, oh, it's hot, let's get some shade. And I've seen that really create quite a bit of blowback in communities we've been working with around the country. And um, let me show you an example uh, of some, some things that we've been working on. Um, a lot of cities are thinking about housing, they're thinking about densifying places. So we've been um, running a bunch of computer simulations, uh, looking at uh, looking at neighborhood blocks that are increasing density of housing development. So one project, for example, looked at increasing housing density on a city block from 16 to 64 uh, units. So instead of 16 single family residential homes, the idea was to bring multifamily into that uh, with, with, housing, with housing shortage, really trying to create a lot more inclusionary zoning, affordable housing into these areas and really kind of varying open uh, parking spaces and different designs. So the big question planners were asking were, can we do this while at the same time reducing temperatures? And um, what we did was run a set of simulation models. And I, I have, we have papers on this, if I, I'd be happy to point you to, I don't have a great deal of time today to talk about it, but we arrayed the physical development in different forms. We used a uh, computer simulation system that essentially blows a lot of hot air through a a specific location and depending on the materials that are used, depending on the configuration of the buildings, depending on the green space, the model gives us differences in average temperature for each of these physical designs. So as you can see, the gray are buildings, the green is, um, is green space or trees, the, the orange is grass, the black is um, asphalt of surrounding roads of the city block. We did a set of plans here and the base case bottom right here was the base case. And we looked at what was the temperature differential of these different um, lots. I wanna bring your attention to the far right of the screen, plan 6S, uh, plan six and 6S, where you can uh, essentially uh, gauge that plan 6B and 6S, where 6B has asphalt all the way through typical multifamily residential development. And then plan 6S is a different form where we have green space in the middle, tucked parking underneath those buildings and then created kind of this horseshoe design for the development. Not too much different, but um, what we found in terms of the temper average temperature in, in Celsius here for a sec, is that the plan 6B actually temperatures went up in that average temperature went up by about um, uh, six degrees Fahrenheit, uh, three degrees Celsius, about five and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And that was, um, that was distributed not evenly across. There were some areas much hotter than others, but on average, the overall um, temperatures went up. Plan 6S, temperatures actually dropped by 1.75 degrees Celsius, about um, three degrees Fahrenheit. And so what we were able to show with this modeling exercise, which we're now working with the Urban Land Institute to corroborate in empirical measurement sense is the idea of how do we increase density while maintaining pre-density temperatures or even reducing temperatures. And this was a big aha moment for me. Uh, we've done this also in, in um, Washington, DC. Don't have time, happy to send the report if you're interested, looking at a public housing project and what we could do in terms of 
green space of an existing development and how that might cool temperatures over time. Um, and we've been able to corroborate some of these with local measurements as well. Um, another green space project that's been really interesting is creating tools that allow communities to identify where green spaces might go. If we'd done this in the past, green spaces go where the loudest, squeakiest wheels are. And for this example, just use my hometown of Portland. We've done this for many cities here. It's a growing shade tool that we created. But what we're essentially looking at is these filters on the left side where we're filtering the amount of canopy across areas of a city. We're able to look at urban heat, air pollution, a lot of socio-demographic factors uh, in those locations. And we can get down to the parcel level even and showing what is it that individual parcel might look like um, where is that individual parcel? And then using a simple uh, Google Street View perspective, whether that parcel has uh, plantable space uh, in that location or not. And so it's a way of getting sociodemographics, physical built environment, as well as, and so local tree groups, the city uh, nonprofits have been working with their constituents to engage even a door knocking campaign around, would you like a free tree in your yard? Would you like a free tree in the public right of way? And so there's been, strategies that have been uh, employed to be far more targeted about how we can expand tree canopy in historically disinvested areas by engaging the communities locally. And that um, just put up a website there, Growing Shade tool. And then finally, uh, we've been working with LA on a project that actually has a second phase here where we conducted interviews with community-based organizations, uh, city folk, and really uh, came up with this uh, attempt to provide guidance for how do you how do we engage communities in their place and advance green space and green infrastructure in specific locations. And so this little simple um, two axes of greening on the X axis, if you will, and effort and investment on the Y axis um, was an attempt to take different forms, different types of greening strategies and I, putting them into different tiers. So tier one is would be an easy, way to get uh, a community member to adopt a tree in their yard, in their, um, in their uh, public right-of-way strip. Um, uh, tier two would require a bit more effort um, with uh, the city, with, with uh, local community groups. And then tier three is these big infrastructure projects where green spaces could be um, introduced when changes are happening in a particular uh, street uh, right away. We're working with Streets LA on some of these designs of getting the tier three very hard, but very potentially important uh, revisions happening with green spaces as an adaptation measure. And all of these are working with community-based organizations and their constituents to essentially describe, design, and develop the, the strategy in a specific location. Um, oops, I wanted to just close out here as I come around the corner and wrap up, um, leaving a little time for conversation um, about this is um, a colleague of mine, Chris Shell, came out with a paper last year that really identified how our systemic biases translate to aspects of structural racism that then affect our physical landscape. I found this a really compelling argument because our empirical analysis has proven as much. And what, what I'm really encouraging us to think about is ways in which the environmental, um, environmental justice movements could be better connected to a lot of the civil rights and social justice movements in that we're not kind of moving into this climate disruption era uh, with, our, uh, with our kind of classic thinking about just here's the hazard, let's just uh, fix it by putting a bunch of trees in it as, as the example I was showing, but let's really use a uh, civil rights social justice framework where we're, where we're talking about power, we're talking about opportunities, we're talking about resources and the needs that a community group may have and trying to really integrate um, aspects of adaptation and, um, um, and preparedness within a, a community setting. So that's really the kind of cyclical cycle or cyclical process that I think is very helpful for us to keep in mind as we're thinking about these adaptation measures. And each place will have their own unique contexts and their own challenges and um, working with local um, organizations can, can, be really, uh, can be really helpful. And I, um, on that note, I'll just kind of end with a, a few principles that I find to be really important in doing some of this work in adaptation and using this climate equity lens. Um, for example, 
um, that all individuals have the right to be protected from climate-induced events, um, that we are shifting the burden of proof from individuals to systemic processes. That's what we're showing with the redlining study, and that we really want to think about um, how these organizational policies, practices can increase impacts, uh, and, and how these systemic processes can mediate impacts to historically marginalized communities. And finally, I'm, I'm a big fan of public health models of prevention as the preferred strategy. So rather than waiting for the event to happen and taking um, um, an opportunity to fix it, um, to really think about it ahead of time, we have an enormous amount of science behind this at this point. And um, being preventative about our approaches can be very strategic in terms of not just uh, safety and health and well-being, but also dollars and cents at the end of the day. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy that um, we're, we're deep into this world of community-based participatory climate science. That's the strategy we use, at least have been using, to engage communities in their place. And this is, uh, as, a, as a person who's been trained in science and uh, has a foot in policy as well, I found this to be a very compelling way to kind of bring the uh, quality, depth, and research grade uh, approach to understanding the distribution of hazards, but with a community, participatory, that's key. And so we have this project called Heat Watch that we've been um, moving, and it really is about getting sensors, uh, research grade sensors. They're very low cost, very, you know, um, um, easy to deploy. We mount them on cars, on bikes. People even walk with these. And we go out and we collect hundreds of thousands of measurements all around a city um, over a, during a very hot day. And I'm, and I'm really delighted this year. I've been working with NOAA on this for a few years, uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, federal agency, to do this work with communities all around the country. We're over 50, 50 cities we've done. And I'm really happy to... Uh, uh, call out at least David, Brian, and Aaron in Columbus, uh, City of Columbus, who are participating in this campaign this year. They were they submitted a successful application to NOAA and will be moving forward on a campaign. So keep an eye out for potentially participating in this uh, campaign this summer, 2022. And it's a way to really uh, tie together the intersectoral work as well as basing a lot of this work in the community and then allowing that to develop what I like to call civic legitimacy with the, with the work and the research that's happening so that we can make swift progress because time is of the essence. So I'm gonna stop there. I know I probably over um, <laughs> filled your ear with a great deal here. And um, I, I'm curious as to any questions, any thoughts, any ways that we can further the conversation. So let me pause here and maybe stop sharing my screen so we can potentially see each other. Well, some of us can see each other with the way this is set up. <laughs> yeah. So right. fa fantastic, Professor Shantis. That really um, resonates here. Um, you know, Columbus is a very undertreed city, for example. In fact, the Columbus Forestry Plan has just been announced where they want to go from a 20% coverage to a 40% to a coverage. Um, I also like, I'm glad you showed that Columbus redlining map. That's really dramatic. Um, we actually have a big copy. I think it might be the, an original of that map on the wall at Kira, just kind of a reminder of um, the legacy that we're facing here in central Ohio. So I wanna talk a bit about, you know, by the way, people in the audience, if you have questions, please put it in the Q and A and we'll get around to it in just, just a few minutes after I uh, talk a bit with Professor Shandis. I, ha I have some questions myself. So, um, you mentioned community engagement, you know, and civic buy-in and things like that. Trees to me this seem to be really like fairly innocent. You know, I mean, you know, trees are the answer, hug a tree, how can anyone argue with trees? Then we have bigger issues. Like for example, um, you know, here in Columbus, we had protests against a, uh, a apartment building development in a place called Schumacher Place. Right now there's a huge battle going on over a bike lane in a neighborhood just north of campus, a proposed bike lane. So um, tell me what community engagement does exactly. I mean, besides just like helping with the, with the data collection, with the science, how do, how do we get people to kind of see the picture uh, on the, the interventions we need to take, especially when it affects their daily lives in their neighborhoods? Yeah, so I, um, thanks, thanks, Harvey. That's really um, important to underscore. Um, it's not necessarily about um, engaging the community uh, simply for data collection and kind of advancing a conversation about what's already in play. It's about really um, 
situating that particular process within a broader set of needs and concerns a community may have. So I may be somebody who's a, you know, thinking about green spaces in cities a great deal, though that may not be front and front of mind for a lot of communities. And they may be thinking about how am I going to even get the next, you know, meal on the table? Am I going to be able to pay the energy bill, et cetera? And so part of what part of what we're trying I'm we're trying to really move is a way to enable um, a conversation that is about uh, localizing those needs and localizing potential adaptation measures. One big uh, concern that comes up is the folks who consistently have uh, died as a result of, for example, heat waves, as we saw, as I was mentioning in the Pacific Northwest, are folks who have been highly isolated. So that relationship between isolation and climate-induced impacts is one that's increasing, becoming increasingly uh, evident um, in not only the, the science of it, but also in the kind of lived experience of, of planners and decision makers. And so part of the community engagement, what it looks like is about being able to engage communities that are not visible, that have been marginalized, that maybe don't speak the language or don't trust government agencies to go to cooling centers during heat waves. It's about finding um, mechanisms by which we can engage communities that are consistently um, for, for, for their own or for uh, social reasons isolating from these uh, climate induced events. So working, so what we found to be really helpful is kind of working with community based organizations and doing that work. And I don't want to go into a community without that, um, without that partner of a community based organization as a researcher going in. So what I do spend a lot of time with is how do I work with a community based organization that has constituents that live in a particularly hot or, or extreme place that could experience a lot of extreme heat. And that could be, um, as we've seen, an area that has been historically disinvested in for, gener for generations. And that, that's really what it looks like for me. It looks like working with a community organization that has the trust, has the depth, has the cons constituents who have been actively um, engaged through their programming, through various projects that they're involved with. And, and yeah, that, that from a university perspective, we are often implicated with research and retreat, going into a community, getting data, and then leaving the community without anything. And so what, I, what I'm hoping to do is kind of have a conversation about how do we turn that around a little bit. Yeah, so how do we do that? I mean, I, I, this is a concern of us here in Curran and many of us here at the Ohio State University and also in the community. I mean, how do, how do we build these enduring partnerships and networks? And not so it's like, well, you know, we get a grant, we come in, we parachute in, do something for three years, boom, we're out again. How, how do we keep this going on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis? I, can't, I guess I just turn that back. Like, how do you keep any relationship going, right? How do you keep any relationship strong and enduring? And it, it really does come to understanding of trust, building of trust, building of uh, experiences together, uh, playing together. There's a lot of projects we have, for example, with community-based organizations that about playing together, like we're designing a mural together, a green space mural with greening and art coming together as a way of uh, bringing a community together. And then that mural, as it turns out, has a, is a means for conversation about what is the future of this particular uh, disinvested neighborhood in East Portland. Like we are having that conversation now with a community advisory board that participated in a um, kind of leadership summit through a local nonprofit, and they are the ones that are really kind of having, helping facilitate a conversation about the future of that place. And so I'm, I really would think it's not rocket science in that sense, because we're all engaged in relationship building consistently. And I, I think as academics, we've often forgot the, the nuances and the ability to kind of translate that research enterprise into a, uh, a rich, enduring, and I think uh, well-intentioned relationship that we're hoping will last a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask one more question, then I want to turn it over to Jerrica, who's going to handle some of the audience questions, both in the Q&A and in the chat. And if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to, to put them in either place, preferably the Q&A. So a lot of what we're talking about here are really um, complex issues and often complex trade-offs. And it does require both holistic thinking and it requires long-term thinking and it also may require costs in the short run. Mm. I'm thinking for example of like like for example building 
better public transit that can actually cause you know disruptions for example in the short run so uh, how do we get people to to kind of see the, those trade-offs and think in that terms of longer time frames and holistically about about some of these um multi-dimensional problems i think in some of your work you mentioned something called multi-solving like taking a multi-solving approach if i remember correctly so i wish you could elaborate on how do we get people to to, to think it think along those lines sure sure i appreciate that that's um one of the things it, uh, just a quick, we, we work on National Science Foundation project, and it's interesting, you know, a group like the National Science Foundation that academics are kind of, in many ways, kind of um, uh, uh, revere, it is really starting to think about the connection between civic life and get, uh, the applied side, as well as this basic research that they've often funded. And we had a project, a large project, $12 million project over the last five years to work with city and community groups across the Western Hemisphere from uh, uh, the U.S. down to Mexico, down to Chile, and um, what we did in that project was really interesting. We did these kind of um, scenario planning exercises where communities came together and talked about, you know, San Juan, Puerto Rico, 2080, uh, New York City, 2080, Portland, Oregon, 2080, Phoenix, Arizona, 2080, and uh, Valdivia, Chile, 2080, Hermosillo, 2080, etc. And it was about what do we want this place to look like in 2080? What do we want it to feel like? And here's some realities of what the climate uh, data we have suggests about this place in 2080. And what we got to was a really robust discussion about the problems that we want to address. And when we got to that, we really started getting at multi-solving agendas. For example, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, one of the biggest things was energy and uh, was consistent uh, energy because hurricanes would come through and dismantle the energy system. And part of it was how do we create a conversation that allows consistent energy? And the multi-solving was, um, was looking at um, community solar as, as a strategy and thinking about food uh, security was another big issue because grocery stores were often um, not available after big events. And so that was another uh, strategy of thinking about food sovereign and food security uh, issues. And uh, what are strategies to multi-solve a food and energy combination? And thinking about solar panels combined with gardens was something localizing um, um, gardens and solar panels was not rocket science, but it was a community coming together to make those decisions and identify those solutions on their own. And that's really where I feel like this field is going right now is much more of academics and planners and decision makers facilitating that conversation and being able to kind of echo that back to community members. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions in both the chat yeah. and Q&A. Uh, Jerrica, please. Yeah, so um, one of our first questions we have is uh, asking about um, you to say more about amplifying existing inequities within um, with simple investing and in uh, marginalized neighborhoods. Um, and they have concerns for uh, nonprofits and community organizations. So what can they keep in mind um, as a nonprofit and a community organization when they wanna start making things better across their community? Um, so amplifying existing inequities um, and small nonprofit. You mentioned that investments in marginalized communities can actually amplify Mm -hmm. you oh, know, yeah. existing equities. And I think that they're asking about, well, tell us what to worry about to yeah, make a I mean, community. Right. Let's, let's touch, let's find the touch points in a particular place that might, um, that might offer a few insights about what the needs that community is facing right now. For example, during COVID, we were seeing a lot of small businesses in a particular community we were working shutting down. And the idea we were going in there with is like green space and green space planning. And they're like, no, 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 we don't. I mean, green space is great, but I, we need to be able to stay afloat during this particularly acute time. And what are strategies for being able to enable our, our financial fiscal solvency as a small business? And so we weren't going in there with like, here, green space is the way to solve your fiscal solvency issues. We were kind of turning that around and saying, what are the ways that your business could then participate in, a, um, in an economic development program that we have before we even start talking about green space? And so that was a means by which we were able to kind of support and connecting the dots for a community member and engaging with a, a, uh, a local nonprofit was really, again, the, the kind of strategy that we, we had. 
Um, NSF, just going back to that, they were, they've now kind of gotten wind of this and they're now, they just put out, I think you may be applying to this, Harvey, was this um, uh, civic award, the civic uh, uh, solicitation, Innovation. which they want the problem to be defined by the community and researchers are kind of brought in to that problem as opposed to the researchers defining the problem and going to the community. I mean, you might think that's a, a, an obvious thing, but it's, it's a paradigm shift uh, uh, to say the least in terms of the way that academics, universities, and particularly research organizations, research supporting organizations like NSF have been thinking. So really, again, kind of grounding this in the place in the communities and what are the challenges they're facing and then bringing that research apparatus into that, into that realm. Thank you. So we have another one um, and it's asking, as you noted, displacement for green development um, and related property value increases is a huge issue as we address and adapt to climate change. What are some policies you recommend, either those already in place um, or in the process or uh, ones that do not exist yet to prevent green displacement? Yeah, this has been a this has been a theme I've been following. I actually had a couple of re uh, uh, students look at this a bit more carefully, and one of the things I've noticed is that the the idea of green gentrification I think has become a has has kind of in my opinion blown out of proportion. It's really gotten to the point where developers are coming in and changing a small single family resident into a very large development that's. Uh, generally higher income community could access, that has a much larger impact on displacement of communities than necessarily planting a few trees in the front of a uh, residential development. The, it, it, we're talking about completely different scales. So I would, uh, in terms of the hugeness of the impact, I would kind of quibble with that a little bit. Um, though what I do think is central is anti-displacement policies. Like what are anti-displacement policies that could be put in place whether that's being able to reduce, uh, improve the um, likelihood of a community staying in place. There's a couple of reports, one out of um, UC Irvine, I know of, of kind of anti-displacement uh, efforts and green space planning. There's a couple of reports I'm happy to follow up with that really identify very strategic, st very strategic approaches that play out very differently in different communities. And so finding the right mix of those strategies for your, for your place I think would be something I would encourage you to dig into a bit more. Um, but there are dozens of those kinds of anti-displacement as well as place-based kind of keeping you, keeping you housed in your home strategies that I know the housing community um, has been deeply involved with. Thank you. So we have one, uh, our next question is, do increases in tree cover, um, do, well, do increases in tree cover decrease temperatures uh, better than reductions in impervious surface coverage. So which one should be prioritized? Oh, it's a tough one. Uh, it's a really tough one. Um, if I, it, it, we found that all tree, that a tree placed in an industrial area, very little effect on temperature, for example, whereas a tree placed in a low uh, canopy neighborhood has a marginally higher effect on temperature. And so when we're looking about, when we're talking about the tree itself, they're not all the same. It really matters kind of where you're placing it. And in fact, what some recent uh, work that we're doing has revealed is that even these well-established trees in very hot environments uh, create an inhospitable, create an inhospitable environment. For example, large tree in an industrial zone that the tree itself, well-established tree may fail, at, uh, may actually have mortality over uh, during an extreme heat event. We saw that happen throughout the Pacific Northwest in, in the summer of 2021. And so um, removing asphalt politically, very challenging, a lot yeah. more so than trees per se. So um, if you can get to the removal of asphalt, much better because generally what you're talking about is opening up some space that could be then cultivated to create enough soil volume for green spaces uh, for trees to actually get it, uh, set up there. So I would, if you have the resources and have the political um, kind of capital to be able to do uh, uh, asphalt removal, I'm a big fan. And so am I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, um, I think we're just at the top of the hour. So I think we'll wrap up there. And uh, we just wanna thank Professor Shandas. That was a, a, a great talk. He really laid out the issues really well and issues that really resonate very strongly here and are very relevant to some of the decisions we're facing here in central Ohio. So thank you very much for your time and for your thoughts on these topics. I also wanna remind people that on uh, March 25th to come back and even you, Professor Shandas, please join us for uh, Robin Lachenko. Um, on the March 25th, and also a panel discussion featuring some OSU thought leaders and community people on, uh, on these topics of choosing our climate legacy. Once again, thank you for joining us and everyone take care always. Goodbye. Thank you.